Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome all of us here to the seventh annual Tyson Family Lecture Series on the Preservation and Restoration of Southern Ecosystems. Um, before John Lane introduces our speaker, Janice Ray, uh, George Tyson is going to say a few words. Uh, George is like a distillation of the liberal arts Wofford idea uh, in one person. Uh, he attended Wofford on a football scholarship. He was a philosophy and literature major before becoming the first Wofford student to be accepted at Duke Medical School. Um, he would then have spent uh, his career as a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, before now working as a longleaf restorationist. He's on the board of the Longleaf Alliance and the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, and his passions include Wofford, quail hunting, old Bordeaux, and the Grateful Dead. <laughs> uh, so without any further ado, uh, please welcome George Tyson to the stage. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everyone. We have a few guests to recognize, and if I overlook anyone, it's only because we didn't recognize you in the audience, so I apologize in advance. First, Mike Slosowski, Walford Provost. Thank you so much for being here. It validates our efforts that the college recognizes the importance of this event. Um, Steve Corey, the editor of the Georgia Review. Philip Juris, one of the most outstanding landscape artists of today. I've admired his, um, particularly his fire paintings for years, and he had a, um, an exhibition here at Walford, I think in 2011, which unfortunately I missed. Um, Drew Lanham, a previous speaker in this series, who has attended, I think, most of the um, presentations since then, and Drew just was awarded, and forgive me, I've forgotten the name of the particular award, but it's the highest award given by the Audubon Society for Nature Writing. So Drew, thank you so much for coming back. We really appreciate you being here. Um, there are various other poets and writers in the audience tonight. Forgive me for not naming you all, but they're here because they love Janice. Rhett Johnson, who was the inaugural speaker in this series, sends his regards to all of you and particularly to Janice. He would be here except that his wife is ill. When I came to Walford all those years ago, the Carolinas and Georgia were still almost entirely rural and virtually everyone was no more than one generation off the farm. So had we read ecology, we would have recognized the land and many of the people described. What we would not have recognized, what we did not yet know, was that the land was broken, injured, and hurting. Today, the situation is inverted. Students are universally aware of the damage to the land, but they frequently are from urban or suburban backgrounds, generations removed from and lacking any connection to the land itself. The awareness of that damage, at least in the Southeast, is due in large part to the woman who honors us by her presence tonight. Others had noted the decline of the longleaf forest and efforts toward restoration had begun, most notably at Auburn with the founding of the Longleaf Alliance by Rhett Johnson and others. But often it is the power of the poet that crystallizes the moment, and Janice Ray was indeed the prophet on the burning shore. After acquiring timberland on the Little P.D. River in Dillon County, South Carolina, Ann and I ultimately decided to restore all 1,700 acres to Longleaf, trying to restore the primeval southern forest. Rhett Johnson helped us to develop a 100-year plan a scary thing to say out loud when you're already in your 60s. <laughs> we see this land as a legacy to our children, to South Carolina, and to Wofford. 
We have tried to make it a living laboratory for the students, encouraging them to participate in the restoration, hoping that when they are my age, they will bring their children back down to Blackwater Pines to see the progress, which at that point will be roughly at the halfway mark. Occasionally there are moments of discouragement. My 100-year plan did not include the flood after Hurricane Florence, which destroyed over 100 acres of newly planted longleaf seedlings and will require a large financial commitment to replant. Yet to be a Southerner is intrinsically to know tragedy and loss. But there's always hope. Years ago, one of my favorite songwriters, Joni Mitchell, said, got to get back to the land to set my soul free. Simply being there in the pine woods is restorative to us. And rereading ecology brings a sense of optimism. I learned this from Anne. It's not a guarantee of success, but rather a reminder of the knowledge that I, we, must try. Thank you, Janice, for everything. Welcome to Walford. Wow. We were driving, I was driving back from the beach with Betsy a, about a year ago, and I either got a call from George or George got a call from me, and he said, I figured it out. We're going to celebrate Janice Ray's 20th anniversary of Cracker Childhood, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, and we started at that point a year ago to, um, to imagine this event. And I thank you, George, for your vision and for your family's vision of what a lecture series in environmental studies can look like in the Southeast, because I know for a fact that there's not another school doing a series like this anywhere in the Southeast. So thank you so much for what you've done. I could talk about 40 minutes about my friendship with Janice but I'm not. I'm going to have a fairly brief introduction because I really want to hear what she has to say about her 20 years with Cracker Childhood. I first met Janice Ray in Montana in 1996. She gave me a copy of her beautiful limited edition chapbook, Naming the Unseen, to take back south with me. I read it with great anticipation. I was not disappointed. The poems are evocative of actual southern landscapes I knew well but the titles betrayed both the eye of a naturalist and the consciousness of a mystic and a spiritual seeker. There were forces bubbling up in all Janice Ray's poems, watery springs and seeps that betrayed the depth of her thinking and experience. After meeting in Missoula, we kept in touch and in the spring of 2000, Janice served as a writer in residence for a five-day progressive river festival organized by the Hub City Writers Project. She spent a week here that spring with Betsy and me in Spartanburg. By the time Janice visited us, she'd just published her first book of prose, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, what, we were here to, what we're here tonight to celebrate. Several days into her visit in Spartanburg, she went downtown and she picked up a newspaper and the New York Times had announced in a bold headline in a full page article, the forests of the Southeast have found their Rachel Carson. That was maybe the first hint any of us had of how big this book was going to be. She's going to talk about that tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing her side of the story. Since ecology, and that's what all us writers call it, hey, if you read Janice Ray's Ecology, and it just sort of spread like, wild, like wildfire in a longleaf pine forest after that. Since Ecology, Janice has continued to write important and powerful books. She has published, among others, Wild Card Quilt, Taking a Chance on Home, and Pinhook, Finding Wholeness in a Fragmented Land, Drifting into Darien, 
the Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Seed, and a beautiful volume of poetry, a full volume called A House of Branches, containing some of those poems I first heard in that chapbook in Montana. There have been many prizes and invitations like this one to talk. Recently, she was a 2015 inductee into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame, and she has two honorary degrees, a few more, and she can make a quilt, a wild card quilt out of them. Um, her work has been translated into French and in, and in Turkey. But now Janice is settled nicely down in Tapnall County, Georgia, with her husband Raven and their daughter Skye, both here with us tonight. There they cultivate a farm called Red Earth. Just last week, Janice showed up on Facebook hauling a massive turnip. We, was it rutabaga? It wasn't a turnip. My identification was not good. We all love Janice Ray. That goes without saying. So we here tonight, we're here tonight because of that love and because of the generosity of the Tyson family to celebrate the ongoing achievement of ecology of a crack, cracker childhood and hear what Janice has to say about it. The book was published 20 years ago this year and it's still a landmark, standing out in the tended field of late 20th century place-based writing, tall as a Mississippi ceremonial mound. But maybe a windmill is a more apt metaphor, given Janice's love for the agrarian world and anything renewable. Maybe ecology of a cracker childhood stands today like one of those farm windmills generating its own energy. The book's still a powerful thing. Please help me welcome my friend, Janice Ray, back to Walford College and to Spartanburg. What thrills me most about Longleaf Forest is how the pine trees sing, the flattened limbs the horizontal limbs of flattened crowns hold the wind as if they're vessels, singing bowls, and air stirs in them like a kettle. I lie in thick grasses covered with sun and listen to the music made here. This music can't be heard anywhere else on the earth. Rustle, whisper, whinny, aria, chorus, lullaby. In the choirs of the original groves, the music must have resounded for hundreds of miles in a single note of rise and fall, lift and wane, and stirred the red cockaded woodpeckers nesting in the hearts of those pines. Now we strain to hear the music, anachronous, it has an edge, it falters, a great tongue chopped in pieces. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's a very special night for me and my family and my friends. Thank you so much, John, for having me. And George, thank you for having the idea and for all you do for Longleaf, for the upstate, for the world. Thank you. Um, 20 years have passed since uh, what I hear called ecology of a crack pot, e ecology of a cracker jack, um, was first published. In that interim, so much has transformed. So I first want to talk about the state of the ecosystem. When I first wrote the book, the fi figures were dismal. And to be honest, they haven't changed that much. 99% of natural stands of Longleaf Forest had been destroyed by 99. Of the original 93 million acres that covered the southeast, less than 3 million remained. The upland forests of the south have endured onslaught after onslaught, turpentining to timbering, shipbuilding to chipping, tree farming to biomass, Plants and animals associated with it have the misfortune of joining the flatwoods in their dis demise, which is a disappearance from the face of the earth. With the loss of our forests, our communities suffer, our cultures suffer, our rural economies suffer, we export our jobs, our landscapes, our health suffers. I have lived my life surrounded by forests that were 
clear cuts. Beloved, thing longed for, I call them clearances, a largesse of beauty removed, even the people gone, the beautiful people, another clearance, I say, surrounded by clearances, the dementia of it, the amnesia, great pockets of silence, holes. The most powerful word in my glossary is gone. My heart breaks saying it. It breaks and breaks and breaks. Lonely, bereft, we swallow our bitters. But grief in its final stages is reconciliation. Graves are lovely too. It's been said, the scar across the breast, the hairless child, smoking rubble. No, do not misread this. This is an elegy, but we remember our forests, the mourner in us, also the warrior. Now we have managed to ensnare the government in our huge desire to see the longleaf pine restored. We have America's Longleaf Restoration Initiative, the Longleaf Partnership Council, and a range-wide conservation plan with its goal to return 8 million acres to longleaf the Longleaf Stewardship Fund of, national, of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Nature Conservancy still going strong, the Longleaf Alliance, and states have come online. The Georgia Forestry Commission has recently hired a young woman to work solely with, with, pine, with longleaf landowners. Um, these 20 years, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people crazier about the pine than I. Cody Laird mailed me a heart pine walking stick and a set of heart pine coasters. He, he wanted me to help him construct a letter to his children and grandchildren about why they should con continue the restoration work at his Oak Ridge Farms. Linda Beam invited me to Two Holly and showed me her stunning forest. Bob McCarthy of Woodlanders Nursery came to our farm one day. We were teaching a chicken workshop and we thought he'd come for that, but no, he had stopped by to bring a cat face he had found. And one winter solstice, marooned in Vermont, Johnny Stowe of the Carolina Sandhills sent a box from the south, twigs of sweet shrub, an eastern box turtle shell, an alligator jaw, a deer scapula. Johnny, who lights a heart pine splinter for incense when he teaches yoga. The biologists, the naturalists, the landowners, the environmentalists. In all that time, Longleaf has inspired a wave of fine art. My friend Philip Juris's breathtaking landscape paintings, especially those of fire, Beth Maynard Young's photographs, P.L. Park, Grant Livingston, and Wilma's recordings of original songs, Dan Corey's poems, the book by Lawrence Early, the Sutter Way book detailing Leon Neal's method of single tree selection, and how many beautiful films, most recently Rex Jones's The Heart of Longleaf. Because of these people, because of their devotion to the majesty and utility and astounding beauty, because of their passion and fascination, because of their daily labors on its behalf, the numbers of acres are rising. In these 20 years, the face of the landscape has been transformed, sapling by sapling, one and a half million acres planted in 2013 alone. What had fallen to less than 1% is climbing. But what I really want to talk about with you tonight is my personal journey these last two decades. And I'm going to go back pretty far here. Probably I knew earlier than eighth grade that I wanted to write. After all, the Bible was poetry and my father worshipped it. I'd heard him say that two manner of people inherit the earth, and those were poets and saints. In eighth grade, my English teacher, Jerry Carter, assigned 30 days of journal entries. Journaling was the new pedagogy, and Mr. Carter wanted to try it. I wrote on lined sheets and arranged them in a notebook, which I still have, on the cover, Johnny Jocular Journal. Seriously, I was 14. The first entry is dated April 22nd, 1976, a Thursday. This is my journal, something like a diary, but you write things 
your feelings, opinions, important things. By Saturday, I was less abstract. The first thing we did today was go unload a trailer full of old crumbly cement blocks. They came from an old house being torn down. Daddy's going to use them to fill up a low driveway. And then on Tuesday, it's true that many people don't realize their advantages or luxuries. They just don't know what to do without something, even for a short time, like hot water. That most people don't even think about it, but I do because I don't run my hot water. I carry it from a, the stove in a kettle. About a year and a half ago, Daddy tried this experiment about turning off our hot water heater for a month to see what happened. So the water heater's been off ever since. A week later, I wrote about a beta club trip to Disney World, seeing people throwing money in canals and wishing wells. I guess if you cleaned out all those places, you'd get almost $400, I wrote. There were hundreds of locations in my childhood where I could learn the power of stories. My grandmother's porch on a Saturday evening with morning doves cooing or my mother's kitchen where grease drifted off skillets of fried chicken and my father regularly invited hobos off US-1 in for a meal. I could learn that culture is a set of stories we tell ourselves about life in a place and how to navigate that life. Later, I would come to believe that a, pla a place produces its own writers to tell its stories. I'm grateful that I got signs early on pointing out my path. For many people, this doesn't happen, sometimes never. After Ecology came out, after a reading at the Margaret Mitchell House in Atlanta, a short-haired, earnest woman approached me. I'm 60, and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, she said. I can see you found your calling. How did you do it? She was looking at me as if I were a counselor. I didn't know what to, what to tell her. I believe it'll come to you, I stammered. I think there's still time. On the other hand, an ornithologist friend knew at six years old what he, that he would study birds. When I was 26, I got married, had a baby, and got a divorce, almost within the span of 12 months, although the actual sequence was got pregnant, got married, had a baby, got legally married, filed for divorce. A few years later, I found myself one Sunday afternoon hiking a remote mountain road in the Andes. I'd taken my young son Silas to Columbia so I could have an adventure teaching English, but I knew I needed to get serious. I needed to settle down into my life, onto my path. I remember vividly that epiphonic moment I was walking through a bowl of tall blue-green mountains, the road dusty before and behind, passing huts constructed by hand of rusty orange clay. These huts were set within small plots of peas and corn, tropical blooms of impatience and geranium spilling from makeshift planters. Wives would say hello shyly, farmers pause their hoeing terraces to pass a few words. So little of the mountain land around me was wild, most of it growing potatoes and grazing milk cows. All of it was a story. I loved nature. I loved riding. Nature and riding, riding and nature. Put them together, a voice said. I walked then with elation, nature and riding, riding about nature, nature riding. Two years later, I was a single mom working as assistant editor for Florida Wildlife magazine. I had a good job with benefits, a cool kid in a free school, a two-story rental with wood floors. At work, I could write chatty stories about fishing rodeos and worm grunting. But I wanted to write more, write better, write crooked, write square, write penniless, write rich, write whisper, write loud. When I first heard the term literary nonfiction as a genre, a springhead opened up, or maybe a mockingbird flew loose from a cage. 
Creative nonfiction is freeing in, the, in that it allows a writer to combine fact with personal experience and to use literary techniques to present this material. It deals in truth. The only problem, I had no time to write this thing, this new thing, or rather this old thing, newly named literary nonfiction, which could be so much like prose poetry and which could immerse me in a wild world. My dream was ballooning. It was getting too big for my circumstances. Night and day, I heard it calling my name. Late in the evening, as Silas slept, I scribbled into a black hardback journal, ideas and feelings. Could I find a wealthy man to marry? Could I move back in with my parents? Could I go to grad school? One day at work, I happened to see a story about Gray Ranch, a 500 square mile refuge in New Mexico. The story, written by Alan Wiseman, published in the LA Times. I read it straight through and worded a letter to Wiseman, sent care of the Times. You're doing exactly the thing I want to do. How did you get there? Good and kind Alan Wiseman answered my letter. Here I need to apologize for the hundreds of letters that I have received since that moment many years ago most of which I have been unable to answer. I thank Wiseman that I still possess his response says very little about what it meant to me. It set me on a course that I had been tacking toward but had not been able to attain. He said that his masters in journalism taught me, quote, nearly nothing about what I actually do. What he actually did was write freelance stories about the environment. About graduate school, he said, the one valuable thing was a single course in science writing, and I may only be talking about a single assignment within that course. Then he gave me his two unbreakable rules. Don't quit asking until you know what the story really is. And second, tell the story, any story, through living, breathing people. I didn't understand those rules when they were given to me, and I'm not sure I understand them now. The University of Montana was among the first creative writing programs to offer a nature writing degree. One joyful day on my stoop, I found out I was accepted. I'd be teaching English 101 with an assistantship. My friend, I'm going to skip a little section here. The house, so, so I found this house in Missoula. The house had an ancient apple tree in the front yard. It had a covered porch. Through a picture window in the minuscule living room, I could watch the snow fall. I could cross the kitchen in two strides. Silas and I shared the one bedroom. The house had another small room the size of a bath, a walled-in area at the back of the dirt-floored garage, four sheetrock walls painted a light peach. The room was unfinished but not dangerous, no raw wires dangling. With an electric heater, I could write there. Grad school started a week after I arrived, and I enrolled in a creative nonfiction workshop with the iconic man William Kittredge, short and bear-like, with a large head, therefore a large brain, who had been raised a cowboy in the ranch lands of the Warner Valley. By the time I got to Missoula, in the fall of 95, he was in his 60s, a man who lived and breathed stories, who was story embodied. He was beginning to transition away from 30 years of teaching. I squeezed through that door. He told our class the first night that we'd have to write two essays and workshop them. I took notes that semester in a tiny pocket memo notebook. The very first line says, have to be careful not to fall into the syndrome that only things that explode are exciting. And the next, we have so many voices, you have to grow up enough to find which one is yours. None of this, this was telling us students how to get an essay on paper. How long should it be, someone asked, and I'm going to skip this section. Which, by the way, he said, um, first of all, he said 12 to 20 pages, and then he turned it around and said 12 to 15, and um, over 20 is pushing it. He winced when he said it. I could see he had no conviction that we had amount to anything. The way Bill taught, 
I would come to understand was with a great deal of what appeared to be uncertainty. He spoke in short, clipped sentences, trying, like Faulkner, to say things that were difficult to say. This, his sentences had a lot of starts and stops, which came across as shyness, as if he really didn't want to be sitting in a chair facing 15 young writers trying to jumpstart them. He said, you know, a lot, as if he thought we already knew the stuff he was saying or he was apologetic to have to say it. Or he figured we wouldn't, couldn't understand what he was saying and he felt ridiculous attempting. Finally, somebody asked him how an essay should be done. Somebody told me how, Bill said, I'll tell you. He proceeded to lay out a schema, which I won't take the time to tell y'all tonight, but at any point, if you want to hear what all the things he told me, boom. I'm not sure I would have become a writer were it not for that treasure chest, which I was not smart enough to unlock on my own, although it was right in front of my eyes in everything I'd ever read. I was then still under the impression that writing was a gift, not an apprenticeship, that it fell outside the bounds of deconstruction because it happened magically. Most everything I've learned about writing to this day is something that another writer or editor taught me. Very little have I figured out on my own. Because of that, I'm tremendously indebted to a lot of people. Bill said you can write an essay and it won't change your life. You can write a poem and it won't. But if you write a book, it will change your life. And in the summer of that first year at grad school, I hiked myself to the tiny room behind the garage and wrote the first draft of ecology. Dear Bill, if I have never adequately expressed my great admiration for and abiding gratitude to you, allow me an attempt. I am acutely aware that much of who I have become is due to your guiding influence when I was most eager and ready. I will always believe that forces of spirit landed me in Missoula under your tutelage and put me in your spheres of influence. What I learned from you would forever change the narrative arc of my life, a life which I have enjoyed and am enjoying, a life where dreams have come true, a life where I have been able to pursue my deepest longings and to watch at least some of them materialize. I am forever grateful that you read my feeble attempt at a first book and handed it back to me, staggeringly crippled as it was with hope in your voice. You found something to praise in ragged first attempts. That has made all the difference in the world. I have arrived at Hollins University in Roanoke on one of these wonderful writer-in-residence gigs. For the past few years, I have had little opportunity to write, having been presented with some of the roadblocks to creativity that life throws up, including an adopted daughter, aging parents, my father with Alzheimer's, a farm to manage. But I am able again here at Hollins to reinvent myself. I arrived two weeks ago with a number of books to work on. In this process of searching for material, I found notes from the literary nonfiction workshop I took with you in fall 95. I've done a great deal of teaching over the years, but I've never been able to approach the material that you brought to our class, affiliation with other writers, a great love of story, working knowledge of the process, a lifetime spent reading. You've been on my mind, and I want to thank you again and again and tell you that you have made all the difference in my life. Doggedly, wait, thank you, doggedly, Janice. Dear Raven, winter rain has fallen all day. I woke to it, and now I'm going to bed as it types on the ledges of the bedroom windows. I miss you and Sky and the farm. But when I start to work, all loneliness vanishes almost instantly 
and I become consumed with how to express ideas of, as fatly and piercingly as I'm able. This peace I've not had in many years, probably not since the summer of 96, when I retreated to a room in Missoula that led to an alley, and by day, day by day, wrote the first book. During breaks, I walked the alleys looking for ripe rhubarb and apricots. After that, phones started ringing, and my father was tapping on the window trying to get my attention, probably he wanted me to sign a book. And I was shaking hand after hand, hugging person after person, signing my own name over and over. I was moving between places, Baltimore, Asheville, Atlanta, New York, Raleigh, St. Pete, Minneapolis, Chicago, years of an unsettling brevity of places. All that signing and handshaking was loud. I can hear rain again. I can hear the sun in the mornings tipping over the edge of the world and the stars shuffling across the mist-filled sky of the valley. I can hear the Milky Way like a small stream running. The night breathes, daylight beats its drum. I have wanted for a long time to vanish back into my art. I thought I might never have a chance again. Love. I, I want to, there's so many things I want to tell you. I really considered doing a PowerPoint so that, so that I could show you pictures of just these beautiful gifts that I've been given over the years. I mean, today I was given another gift. Um, my friends Brent and Angela Martin came from the mountains to, to be all together. Brent is a nature writer and they run a nature expedition company there called Alarca. And he had painted me a folk art sign that's got a big canning jar. It's, Philip gave me one of, I mean, I mean, I'm talking a painting that's worth thousands of dollars. Philip just gave me a painting. It's happened, I learned very quickly that in those days, 20 years ago, that to write a book was really to like be shot like an arrow into the heart of people. And everywhere I went, people opened their homes to me and they opened their dinner tables and they faded me and they rode me around and showed me things. And, and I, because of that, I was given so much honor. Um, what I want to talk about, though, in just these last minutes, I want to, I'm, I'm skipping a whole section that I actually wrote for tonight on anonymity. Because since the book came out, I've had a love-hate relationship with anonymity. That part of me, um, part of me wants, knows I want to get the word out about these things. And then there's this other part of me that does not want attention. I want to be a quiet person at home. And it's just been this kind of, um, uh, it, I was going to say horrific, but let's just say challenging part of being a writer that, well, enough said. However, I began some time ago um, to think about power. Because I, so I came into writing as this marginal, young, southerner, you know, a person with a lot of shame because of the way I talked, because of being raised on a junkyard, because of the mental illness in my family, because of the desperate poverty. And, you know, so to talk about 20 years of ecology without really talking about power uh, would kind of be unimaginable. Um, there are two kinds of power. One is power over, which is hierarchical, and has, you know, usually leads to pretty horrible conclusions. Uh, much of power is power over. The right and just and necessary kind of power is personal power, which believes in the potential and your, of yourself and others. Personal power is the ability to make your life go well. The source of my power is love of language, inherited from my father and his Elizabethan Bible, 
Anglo-Saxon language, figs and grape leaves, burning bushes, a basket of reeds, made of reeds, an ark. In childhood, I learned language, memorizing Bible verses, memorizing poems, listening to stories. The source of my power is words, depth and range and strength of words. The source of my power is in my hand, a hand with a pen, the pen moving, the words building. This is not a power to be taken lightly. Wor worlds can be created with words, with language, with the spirit bonds between words, and worlds can be destroyed, the rod parting the Red Sea. My father loved to argue, to stack bricks of arguments one on top of the other to make a wall. My power is that I too can build a wall with words. To shut someone out or to construct something grand, ecology gave me that. I'm thinking now of how lucky I've been in this life to be able to meet and interact with and love so many people, a lot of whom are here. It gives me a power I would, as a child, have never dreamed. I'm thinking of this gift of voice, of the body's voice, but also the larger voice of words printed on cellulose, shooting from a press, pages of words, words coming from the mouths of woodpeckers, strings of words woven into the nests of birds, howling words, words wrapped around the trunks and limbs of trees. I'm thinking, always thinking of this, what else can I do with this power? How can I lever it to more transformation? How? Now, much as I detest the particular metaphor I'm going to use, I am an empire builder. I want more books, more money, bigger audiences, a longer reach, grander awards, bigger print runs, more visible results. I'm sorry, but I do. I didn't recognize this fact for a couple of decades. I'd been reared as a woman from the beleaguered South, a nature writer, marginalized. I remember being asked in a Q&A at Berry College, which hosted the Southern Women's Writers Conference for years, if being a woman had held me back. I'd been a feminist since high school, I kept my own name when I married and never let being a woman stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I drove a truck, I changed tires, I changed my own oil. I answered the question at Barry with all the honesty possible at that time that no, being a woman had not cramped or stifled or silenced or bound me. I had been the driver of my own vehicle. I always steered. I was proud to say that. The question, however, reverberated in my head almost daily. For years, I revisited it. Had being a woman held me back? I, I couldn't answer it fully until some years later. Like a woman-owned company, I could fill a position. I could rep the South and womanhood and poverty. How many times have I been the only woman on a panel? in an anthology, at a reading, how easy it was for organizers to have me there. Like Ruth in the Bible, I was good. I was cheerful, friendly, even apologetic. I was happy with what I got. I felt I earned what I got and nothing else. I was not going to ask for more. Like my mother, I had a house to take care of, meals to cook, laundry, a child to raise. All that took time. Like my mother, I could not afford a housekeeper. Unlike my mother, I was also for over two decades the head of my household, the breadwinner. To write my sixth book, The Seed Underground, took three years. Seed diversity is a subject I've been crazy about since high school, and I was working with one of my favorite publishers, Chelsea Green, and with a stellar editor, the book splashed and won five or six national awards and was translated into French and Turkish. It got my picture in tons of newspapers. But my income hovered at poverty level. I'd been paid in advance, I had been paid an advance of 4,500. 
Royalties weren't flowing into my bank. I didn't have health insurance. Our nation was slowly climbing out of a deep recession. Fewer people were reading, more and more caught in the glass cage of technology. Book sales were down, bookstores closing, writers doing their own marketing, no book tours, podcasting almost seemed a better alternative. So book writing wasn't working. I said I was quitting. But then some years later, I realized I couldn't quit, and I returned. Writing was like a flame inside me that raged. I was burning up. I arrived, and I still arrived, at my writing desk in the mornings burning, and I burn until other responsibilities pry me from my chair. I was up, I am up before dawn, working into the night. Only by telling our, much of the work of art is to be done in far corners, daily, invisibly, with little sucker, limited resources. If that is what you too want, my prayer is for you to be put in hard places. Only by telling our stories and imagining new ones will we create a world in which we can all lead lives that are more meaningful and sensible and fulfilling. May your stories be easy to find and easy to write. Um, last section. When I was in grad, when I was in uh, undergrad school at Florida State University, I used Pell Grant money to put down to a down payment on 12 acres of a very rare ecosystem in Florida called Appalachia Appalachia Steephead. Um, it's a remnant, an extant Appalachian system that has trillium and um, rhododendron, trout lilies, a really gorgeous uh, cliff, something you would never think of when you think of Florida. So it took me a while to pay it off, years actually, and then there were years where just paying the property taxes was a struggle. Um, you know, people ask me why I didn't sell it. It was full of old growth trees um, in, I mean, like three and a half feet wide trees. Uh, hollies, uh, magnolias, loblolly pines, a beautiful, beautiful system. Um, when Michael hit in October, it was like a, a fist. It cannonballed a, a very narrow but powerful swath up through Mexico Beach and Port St. Joe, and it got to Gadsden County and went through um, Sycamores, the, what I call the place. So. Climate change, the climate crisis, did something uh, that I would never do. It laid Sycamore, this beautiful ecosystem that I have been protecting, to the ground. 90% of the old growth trees are gone down, and 50% of all its trees are gone. Despite the story of Sycamore, despite the climate crisis, despite the cutting that is still going on right now in, throughout the South. Despite a March tornado last week that killed 23 people near Opelika, I am not without hope. I have been asked upteen times, am I hopeful? Where do I find it? I have come to ask of hope, who needs it? Is hope a prerequisite for the great work? In hundreds and thousands of situations, we do what needs to be done even when the future appears hopeless. Do you find out your newborn daughter has autism and stop feeding her? Do you realize that we may not get back the 93 million acres we lost? Do you understand that the red wolf may be gone forever from the Southlands? What about love? Why doesn't anybody ever talk about love as motivation? Why don't we recognize that we do what we do because of love? So the question, how do I stay hopeful, becomes as ludicrous as how do I stay love-filled? 
I wake every morning listening to the great crested flycatcher call from the red maple, and I watch that fat old orange sun rise flamboyantly over the neighbor's swamp. I watch hummingbirds in the red valentines of Buckeye. In the evening, I walk outside and gaze up through the bare limbs of the swamp chestnut oak into the starry, starry sky above the farm and watch a meteor blaze a trail to earth. My sister comes to visit and wants to see a longleaf forest, so my brother and I walk her through the golden meadows of fall grasses at Moody Forest. We show her the circular leaves of wild indigo, point out the resinous holes of red cockaded, praise the blazing star. In this wild tangle, I say to my sister, seeking words for how I feel, in these old trees, these knots, unable to say exactly what I'm trying to say, this is our story, yours and mine. It's more than our story. This is our love. There is no place on earth more full of love than this. Before I end with a poem, I want to thank my friend John Lane, who, for doing this retrospective. So when he told me about it, I was reluctant, you know. I, I've always said I never saw fame or fortune until more recently. Um, what I've sought is community and intimacy and meaning and deep relationship and for us to make a difference in how we live on planet Earth. But I'm here because ecology afforded me at a deeper level of community, a chance for my life to have more meaning, a chance for deeper relationships and greater intimacy with people I admire and respect, all kinds of people who just plain care. So thank you, John and George. John and Betsy Teeter have been at the top of that list of intimates. Thank you all for wanting for honoring my work with this event. I want to thank the scholars Dorinda Dahlmeyer and Peter Brevet and Tara Power Powell for taking the time, energy, and brain power to think deeply about it. I thank my family, my husband Raven Waters, my son Silas, who's now 30 and lives in Northampton, Mass, and my daughter Skye for, for being with me. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight, for caring, and I want to thank everybody not in this room, the people who worked behind the scenes to make all this happen, the cooks and accountants, and I'm also thankful for the natural resources that brought us here. A friend some time ago sent this poem from Adrian Rich, and it says, My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. And so with you, old friends and new, my lot is cast. You who with few extraordinary powers, with hearts full of love, continued the work to reconstitute and heal ourselves, our relationships, and the world through story, through scholarship, through vision, through policy, through service. Thank you for all you do and have done for the wild and broken world and all that is before you to do. Because life is utterly fragile unendingly fascinating, ceaselessly beautiful, humbling, awe-inspiring, divine. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, Janice will be down here at the front for a while if you want to come down and say hello. And thanks to everybody for, for coming out tonight. Thanks for coming to the Tyson series.